We have been discussing where atoms come from. We learned that 13.8 billion years ago, the universe came into being. All of the hydrogen, helium, and lithium atoms came into being in the first 300,000 years after the Big Bang. As matter began to clump together, stars formed, and nuclear fusion in the stars created all of the heavier atoms. Forming these heavier elements occurs during nuclear reactions. But before we dive into nuclear reactions, let's review a little bit. Remember, the atomic number defines the element. When discussing nuclear reactions, you'll see element symbols written like this. The atomic number, or the number of protons, is written as a subscript to the left of the symbol. The mass number, which is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, is written as a superscript to the left of the symbol. Since protons and neutrons are both found in the nucleus, we call them nucleons. With this in mind, what element has the atomic number 19? You can look on the periodic table to see that this answer would be B, potassium. How about this? Which of the options below is an isotope of carbon-12? The answer here is A, carbon-13 is an isotope of carbon-12. Remember that isotopes have the same number of protons and a different number of neutrons. We could take this further and recognize that since carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons, carbon-13 would still require the same number of protons, six protons, but it will have seven neutrons. It has one higher um, mass number, so it must have one more neutron. Remember, isotopes have the same atomic number, but different mass numbers. Okay. One last review question. How many protons and neutrons does nitrogen-12 have? The answer here is B. All nitrogen have seven protons. So 12 minus seven would give us five neutrons. Remember, isotopes have the same number of protons and a different number of neutrons. First, we need to put into context what we've learned so far this semester. In the first unit, we discuss Dalton's atomic theory. Part of Dalton's atomic theory states that chemical reactions involve the rearrangement of atoms. Dalton did not have the means to examine nuclear reactions, which involve the nucleus. We will discuss chemical reactions in later chapters, but for now, recognize that chemical reactions do not involve nuclei. They involve electrons. In this unit, we will discuss nuclear reactions, which involve reactions resulting in the changes to atomic nuclei. Nuclear reactions, which again involve the nucleus and not electrons, will often result in changes in the element. Remember that an element is defined by the number of protons in the nucleus. Nuclear reactions generally occur at very high temperatures or energies, which is why they occur in stars. There are three different types of nuclear reactions. We could have fusion, fission, and radioactive decay. Remember Rutherford? He used alpha particles to gain evidence that atoms had a nucleus in the gold foil experiment. The alpha particles came from a radioactive element. So let's start by taking a closer look into fusion. Fusion can occur under very high temperatures. At these temperatures, electrons have so much energy that they can overcome the attraction to the nucleus, forming a plasma. A plasma is an electrically neutral medium of unbound positive and negative particles. It is electrically conductive and responds strongly to the electromagnetic fields. Like a gas, a plasma doesn't have a definite shape or volume. Plasma is the fourth fundamental state of matter, along with solid, liquid, and gas, and the most abundant form of matter in the universe. 
This is where the vast majority of our nuclear reactions are occurring, in stars. So now we know where fusion commonly happens. But how does fusion commonly happen? Shown here is an image of a fusion reaction. In this image, protons are shown as pink spheres with a plus sign on it, while neutrons are shown as blue spheres with no charge. Deuterium and tritium are isotopes of hydrogen, which has one proton. Deuterium has one neutron, and tritium has two neutrons, respectively. If deuterium and tritium come together with enough energy to overcome the electrostatic repulsion, they can fuse. This results in the formation of a helium nucleus, a neutron and a lot of energy. A lot of energy is released in all nuclear reactions, which is why we can use nuclear reactions for power. Here's the nuclear equation for this reaction. Remember that the left superscript shows the total number of nucleons, the protons and neutrons, and the left subscript shows the number of protons. You can subtract the number of protons from the number of nucleons to find the number of neutrons. Notice that we can balance the number of protons and nucleons. We don't worry about electrons here because they don't affect the equation. Remember that this is a nuclear reaction and that electrons are not within the nucleus. We will soon be able to balance these equations and determine what sorts of products will be emitted. To understand nuclear reactions, let's think about what happens as two nuclei that do not have electrons approach one another. As the nuclei move together, but are still at distances greater than the size of the nucleus apart from one another, what forces act on them? The answer here is A, an electrostatic force. This is repulsive, in this case, since both nuclei would have a positive charge. Keeping with the notion that two nuclei are approaching each other, but still farther apart than the distance of one nucleus, what happens to the potential energy of the system? The answer here is A, it should increase. Since these two nuclei are repelled by each other, the potential energy will increase while they are approaching each other. Imagine trying to push the two north poles of two magnets together. If the nuclei are repelling each other, how could they possibly fuse? Normally, we only need to consider the electrostatic forces. Since the nuclei repel, they should reverse course and move away from one another. However, if there is a lot of kinetic energy, the nuclei can get even closer together. Once they are very, very, very close together, ab about the size of the nucleus, the strong nuclear force comes into play. Strong nuclear force is responsible for the stability of the nucleus. As a reminder, there are four fundamental forces. We're now very familiar with the electromagnetic force and gravity. Gravity is very, very weak and only important when dealing with very massive objects. The electromagnetic force is stronger. We brushed over them before, but now we'll start to care about the strong and weak nuclear forces. The weak nuclear force is important during radioactive decay. But what we really care about right now is the strong nuclear force. It is the strongest of the fundamental forces, but only acts at very small distances on the scale of the nucleus. It is an attractive force and it holds the nucleus together. So if nuclei can get close enough, a strong nuclear force can come into play only at distances of about one nucleon, a proton or a neutron, apart. But a great deal of energy is required to overcome the electrostatic propulsion. With this in mind, if the, nuclear, if the nuclei are within the range of the strong nuclear force, what will happen to the potential energy of the two nuclei as they move closer together? The answer here is B. The potential energy will decrease because they are attracted to one another by the strong nuclear force. Let's pull all of this together 
and draw a potential energy diagram for two protons approaching each other. My suggestion, like with the atoms, is to start with the protons far apart, and then think about what happens as they move closer together. Shown here is a set of axes for you. On this set of axes, the r is the distance between the two nuclei. The distance is large on the right and gradually decreases as you move left until the nuclei are touching at a distance of zero. The vertical axis is potential energy. The top of the axis would indicate a very high potential energy, while lower on the axis would indicate a low potential energy. Try to draw a line that would represent the relationship between the potential energy and distance between two nuclei as they get closer together. Go ahead and pause the video and give yourself time to consider your diagram. Which of the curves here represents what you drew? How does what you drew compare to what is shown here? It's not too late to change your response. The diagram that you drew should have looked something like what is shown here. When the two protons move together, they are initially repelled by the electrostatic forces causing the potential energy to increase. This is called the columbic barrier and is why nuclei don't fuse together under normal circumstances. The nuclei must have a lot of energy to get over that barrier. Once over that barrier, the nuclei are attracted by the strong nuclear force. This pulls them together and the potential energy drops. Just like forming a bond, the fusion of these two nuclei releases a lot of energy. If the electrostatic force were the only force acting on the protons, the nucleus would burst apart. The strong nuclear force is what holds the nucleons in the nucleus. However, it only acts over very short distances. Every type of nuclear reaction releases a tremendous amount of energy, way more than even the most exothermic chemical reactions. The energy can be accounted for using the famous equation E equals mc squared which models when mass is converted to energy. In the image shown here, four protons are fused together to form a helium nucleus. Two protons turn into neutrons, releasing positrons and energy. Here, the mass of the products is less than the mass of the reactants. The mass that is destroyed is converted into energy in the form of E equals mc squared. In nuclear reactions, Mass and the identity of the atoms, the type of the element, are not necessarily conserved. This is very different from chemical reactions, in which atoms and mass are not created nor destroyed. Every type of nuclear reaction is accompanied by a change in mass. This is called the mass-energy equivalence, and we can calculate it using Einstein's famous equation. This energy is called the binding energy and is the energy released when mass is converted to energy. How does the loss of mass get converted into energy? Well, the mass that is lost, also called the mass defect, is converted into binding energy. Every kilogram of mass releases an entire joule of energy. Through simple unit conversion, we can see how this relates to the E equals mc squared equation. The energy released in this process is much greater than the amount of energy released from chemical reactions. Let's take a closer look into the mass defect. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen containing one proton, one neutron, and one electron. If we add up the masses of each of these individual particles, and compare that to the mass of the atom, we can see that they are different. How can this be? Well, the difference in mass, or the mass defect, is 0 0.002388 atomic mass units, where the atomic mass units is uh, another convenient unit for our atomic mass. This calculation can be done in atomic mass units or kilograms. You can use the conversion factor shown here to change this into kilograms if it would help you gain perspective. Anytime a nuclear reaction occurs, there is a mass defect. There's also a change in mass, which translates to a change in energy.
If we compare the energy released from a nuclear reaction to a chemical reaction, two grams of deuterium could release up to two times 10 to the eighth kilojoules of energy. Compare this to the combustion of methane, where 890 kilojoules is released per mole of methane. Fusion releases roughly 10 million times more energy per mole than combustion. Wow. With all the potential to release so much energy, why don't we use fusion reactors more often? To get fusion to occur, you have to get over that columbic barrier, which takes a lot of energy. The temperature would have to be about as hot as the sun. Alternatively, we could combine our plasma within a magnetic field. The problem is that it takes a lot of energy to do this, and so far we haven't found a way to break even. So the reason we don't use fusion more often is because it's very difficult to get the energy back that we had to put into the nuclear reaction in the first place to get it started. The sun, however, is hot enough to allow fusion reactions to happen. In the sun, there are two types of fusion that occur. Reaction one, hydrogen burns. Four protons fuse to give a helium nucleus, two positrons, and energy. In reaction two, where helium is burning, three helium nuclei fuse to make a carbon nucleus and lots of energy. Further fusion in the stars leads to the formation of the heavier atoms. What do you think happens to the total number of atoms as fusion happens? Although the type of atoms involved in a nuclear reaction is not conserved in a nuclear reaction, the number of nucleons are. When modeling nuclear reactions, we need to ensure that each side of the equation has the same number of nucleons. Check out the provided resources to learn more about balancing nuclear reactions.